Yes, it's Joe Walsh. It's like your favorite station. Play. Hey, y'all, this is Kristen Casey, author of Rock Monster, My Life with Joe Walsh. Just like they do on the radio. And you are listening to Joe K on the Play That Rock and Roll podcast. Oh. Now it's all about the podcast, and I'm telling you, Joe K is one of the best. <laughs> You first came into Joe Walsh's life in 1987, right? 88. 88, okay. So you, you met him in 88, and you met him through uh, Rick Rose's girlfriend? Yeah, I mean, loosely, I would call her his girlfriend. Okay. I mean, Rick, as long as I knew Rick, I, I never knew him until much later in life, shortly before he died a few years back, yeah. um, to have one girlfriend. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. so, he had, you know, he had, um, usually when I would see him with a woman, it would be the same woman for, you know, six months, depending on what city we were in, you know. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> like he might, I, there might be two women he was seeing simultaneously, but yeah, he moved around a lot. But my friend Vicky that I worked with in Austin at Sugars, we stripped together. She was an amazing woman, still is an amazing woman. And she's kind of a role model for me. She was a few years older and she was a real rocker chick. She was from Detroit. She'd been going, you know, getting backstage for years. Um, I wouldn't call her a groupie, but she loved rock and roll. Like she knew the music. She was all about the music. And she turned me on to a lot of rock and roll, like, you know, Peter Frampton and Ted Nugent. And, you know, because I was 18 when I met her and I didn't really fit in with the other strippers, um, but, I, but I, I fit in with Vicky. And so, you know, we'd hang out after work and go to her place at two in the morning. And from two to four, she would just be playing me like the best 70s rock that okay. I, you know, and like schooling me kind of, you know, yeah. in rock and roll history, whatever. And, um, and at some point she had met Rick and Joe when they came through town, like probably in 87 um, at an autograph signing party at a record store here in Austin. And she and Rick just immediately hit it off and kind of started dating. And all I knew at the time, you know, when I'm at work, I'm really busy. I, she said something about dating this bass player. She may have mentioned he played with Joe Walsh, but the name meant nothing to me. So if she mentioned it, it went in one ear and out the other. And then one day, a few months into this, she says, oh, so the guys are in town. Take me to the hotel after work if you could. I need a ride. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And um, I actually... Uh, at the last minute decided the guy I was seeing kind of casually was getting too serious and I needed to go break up with him that night. So I tried to get out of taking her to the hotel and she's like, no, no. She literally pulled this guy out of my car in the parking lot. She's like, you yeah. promised me a ride. And thank God she did that. So on the way to the hotel, she's like, you know, so, you know, when you drop me off, park the car, come in. I want you to meet um, my bass player's, you know, friend, the singer, guitar player. I think you guys will hit it off. So it was, I think kind of a, you know, subversive fix up. She waited sure. till I was in the car. Um, and I was like, I don't want to meet anybody, but you know, why not? Yeah, he'll probably be interesting. I, I figured he was some, I liked older men, but I figured he was some kind of one hit wonder from the seventies, but still oh. I'd meet him and, and then, uh, you know, probably, you know, fake a yawn and go home 15 minutes later. And um, 15 minutes later, I was, you know, this close to being in love and, Really, uh, I, I mean, within 20 minutes, I was, I thought I, I've met the man I'm going to marry. I was really in love and I stayed till like eight in the morning. And, um, uh, and then the next day went to the concert that they were playing. And that's when I started, when I realized who he was, because I started recognizing every single song he played. And I was just like, holy, I had no idea that he was that famous or that, you know, prolific. And um, so, no, I'd fallen in love with him thinking he was just some one-hit wonder from the 70s. That's funny. Yeah, I've seen Joe in concert uh, a handful of times, and, you know, it's, he's, one of those, he's one of those guys where, like, every song I've heard on the radio, you know, it's just he's just got such a catalog of, of great hits. Uh, but before, before we talk about Joe, let's let, I want to circle back to, uh, to Rick a little bit, because I, I feel like you, Rick, Rick the bass player, gets mentioned a whole bunch of times along with Joe, but, like, I haven't read any profiles of him ever. And I, and I think he, now that he's gone, he's sort of underappreciated, at least in rock history. What 
do you remember about Rick as far as his personality went and how his friendship uh, with Joe was like? I'm so glad you asked, first of all. Thank you for that. Because I tell you, and anyone who knows or knew Rick will say this, he was a very special person. Th this world was a better place with him in it, and I, I will never not miss him. And I know Joe feels the same. They had an incredibly close relationship, and it was such a beautiful thing. I, I... I feel like in some ways Rick was probably more important in Joe's life than I was oh. or, or, or more important. Well, certainly more important to his work, but, but, but more of a stabilizing factor. Rick was a very chill guy. And, you know, Joe was always, um, he always had to be on, you know, he sort of had to be, whether he was on stage or doing interviews or, you know, he was the guy in charge. Everyone in our circle basically worked for him, even his good friends like Joe Vitale, his drummer, and, and yeah. Rick, the bass player. Um, but basically, everyone was on his payroll. And um, yet, Rick and him had such a genuine friendship. I mean, and, and Joe noticeably just relaxed around him. And, and Rick just sort of organically brought out Joe's, you know, funny side not where he was like trying to be funny just where he you know they just kind of played off each other because rick was really so much the straight man um and he was yeah i think that it was just a really important friendship and um also he was one hell of a solid bass player you oh, know sure, i mean yeah. and yeah like my musician friends all like he's just very very solid you know i mean neil he wouldn't have played with neil young for as long as he did if he wasn't an amazing bass player right yeah yeah, and he's rhythm a great section gets no guy. respect. <laughs> What's that? I said rhythm section gets no respect. Oh, I know, I know, right? <laughs> uh, bass players are always they hold the band together. Yeah, and yet they don't get you know a lot of uh, they don't get all the attention and accolades. But um, but I'll tell you, Rick was hilarious. We spent more time in that guy's garage just like laughing my my butt off. I loved him, and in fact, shortly before he died, which I want to say was maybe four or five years ago, somewhere in there. Yeah. We could, I, we could talk. Do you I remember? have to look it up. I think 2014, but I could be yeah, that, that's, on that. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. We would talk every couple of years, um, and he was actually seeing someone in Austin, um, but he had a girlfriend in L.A., and um, it, was, it was very complicated. So he was coming out here once in a while, and uh, we never could connect. And our last conversation was like, yeah, next time you're out here, we got to get together. And then just very soon after that, he died. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's cool that you, guys, that you guys stayed in touch. I remember watching a uh, Joe on uh, Howard Stern show a couple years, well, actually more than a couple years ago now. And he was talking about um, coming out of ad addiction. One of the things you have to do is basically cut all the toxic people out of your life, all the enablers. Uh, all the people that get you into trouble, and that was why he hadn't gone on Howard Stern show in like 20 years or whatever it was. And they asked about Rick, and Joe said Rick was exempt. You know, he stayed in touch with Rick. You know, he didn't cut him out for whatever reason. So, yeah, I just wanted to know a little bit more. So it sounds like you and Rick got along really well too. Yeah, and it's a good thing. I mean, I I, I never had a crossword with him. I never had a negative thought about him. Um, I would have to assume he probably, I don't think he ever thought poorly of me. I think that there were, were probably times that he thought Joe and I might be better off apart because we, you know, when things were getting so bad, we were fighting all the time, but I never felt anything but, you know, love from him. And, uh, you know, he was as much, it was, unless Joe and I were actively being intimate, you know, Rick had carte blanche. He was, he was, it was almost like a threesome, you know, like a non-sexual threesome. Like he was over so often. He, when we bought our house in studio city, he lived as the crow flies like a mile. And so the guys got some, um, this was before texting um, or, you know, anyone had computers uh, or at least, you know, the internet as we know it. And so Joe got a couple of CB radios and um, the guys would just communicate literally on CB radios just whenever they, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, he was a very major part of our life and I loved having him around and he was, you know, he was a real practical joker, but, it, but never in a way that was offensive or, 
anything like that. I just really love the guy. Absolutely one of my favorite podcasts. Got to give him a listen.